Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Old High St. Stephen's Church this morning. It's a very warm welcome if you are a visitor especially, and it's lovely to connect with you. This service will be recorded on audio and video. It's a great joy, but it's also with sadness, of course, that we reflect that the late Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, has passed away. So we're going to just do a one-minute silence, and then at the end, as we pray for others, we will, of course, remember the royal family. So let's begin our service with just a short minute of silence when you can pray for the family and for the nation. Grace and peace to all of you from the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks to Jim and Deborah for reading and praying and to Callum and his dad for technical skills and Christine ticking off names. I'm on holiday for the next two weeks but look forward to seeing you all in Old High at the beginning of May. Um, I caused a traffic jam last week. My husband would say it's not the first time. <laughs> so I'm not going to be at the end of the aisle this week. I'm going to go right out and right round so that I can meet you in the fresh air. But there will be someone there with a bowl should you wish to contribute an offering. I think that's all the announcements. Our call to worship comes from the first letter of Peter, chapter 1, and I'm reading from the message. What a God we have. How blessed to have this fellowship with the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he was raised, we have been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. That future starts now. And so we join in worshipping the Lord together as we stand, if you're able, to sing him 425, the Saviour died but rose again, triumphant from the grave. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let us pray. Lord of all being, the spectrum of your power defies our imagination as we contemplate the many blessings and gratitude for our lives and of those whose lives have inspired us living and since passed away. We take for granted that our planet Earth, that on our planet Earth, there will be a sunset and a sunrise with certainty each day without human assistance. Are we not astounded that we are part of your infinite creation in vastness extending to millions of galaxies and in minuscule to the electron, 2,000 billion times smaller than a grain of sand, and so it goes on. The majesty of our God cannot be measured by human instruments, cannot be constrained with human boundaries, cannot be contained within human vessels, cannot be explained by human thought. The majesty of our God is beyond human comprehension. Yet, he sees our thoughts and reads our hearts. May we know it and be touched by his eternal love in this, our act of worship. As we humble ourselves in your presence, Father God, how can we not bring our praise to you more each day? Our Father who loves us more than we deserve, forgive us where we have not been the best that you would have us be. Refresh us in our faith as we pray for the insight of your Holy Spirit to guide us into new beginnings. God of mercy, God of promise, we praise your name together with your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who would die even for you and for me. And in Jesus' name and in his words, we further praise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's reading is taken from Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. The walk to Emmaus. On that same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village named Emmaus, about 11 kilometers from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. As they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them. They saw him, but somehow did not recognize him. Jesus said to them, What are you talking about to each other as you walk along? They stood still with sad faces. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening there the last few days? What things, he asked. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. This man was a prophet and was considered by God and by all the people to be powerful in everything he said and did. Our chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and he was crucified. And we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to set Israel free. Besides all that, this is now the third day since it happened. Some of the women of our group surprised us. They went at dawn to the tomb, but could not find his body. They came back saying they had seen a vision of angels who told them that he is alive. 
Some of our group went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are! How slow you are to believe everything the prophets said! Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they held him back, saying, Stay with us. The day is almost over and it's getting dark. So he went in to stay with them. He sat down to eat with them, took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke the bread and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, wasn't it like a fire burning in us when, we talked to, when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? They got up at once and went back to Jerusalem where they found the 11 disciples gathered together with the others and saying, the Lord is risen indeed, he has appeared to Simon. The two then explained to them what had happened on the road and how they had recognized the Lord when he broke the bread. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Thank you, Deborah. I forgot to thank our musician, extraordinaire Pam. (laughs) We're going to do things slightly differently today because I like to do that, keep you on your toes. Um, I'd like you just to take a moment... And it's not my teaching background to check if you were listening. It is really, but no. Um, I would like you to take a minute to think through the sequence of events in the Bible reading that we've just heard. Okay, I'll give you a clue. It starts with a road. (laughs) It starts with a road and two people. And then there's a conversation and someone else joins them. Would you just take a moment to see if you can remember, if we weren't in lockdown, I would have you chatting to one another, which I know some of you don't like, but you're lucky. Today, you just have to think for yourself. Go back over the sequence of events and see how much you can remember. What kind of mood were the people in? Did they know the person that was coming? Or was it a stranger that joined them? What did they talk about? And then what happened? Did they go their merry ways? Where did they come to and what happened there? I can hear your brains ticking like a clock. (laughs) We're now going to pause to listen to an old spiritual And I'm hoping to get the words up. You know, sometimes technical things are not the easiest things to work. But I'd like you to look at the words. It's a song uh, written in America many, many years ago. But it's been re-recorded by a friend of mine called Lynn's Honeyman. And here are the words. Thank you, Joan. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. All along my pilgrim journey. 
Deborah is now going to retell this story and I invite you to listen more attentively so that you can listen for a word or a phrase that God is speaking to you about today. It will be a word or a phrase and it may already be with you or it may be the picture that I've put up. But something as you listen, you can close your eyes if you choose to, but as Deborah retells the story, listen for a word or a phrase. I'm not going to ask you what you've chosen, so don't worry. You'll be completely anonymous. Thank you, Deborah. <clears throat> the walk to Emmaus. On that same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village named Emmaus, about 11 kilometers from Jerusalem, and they were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. As they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them. They saw him, but somehow did not recognize him. Jesus said to them, what are you talking about to each other as you walk along? They stood still with sad faces. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening these last few days? What things, he asked. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. 
This man was a prophet and was considered by God and by all the people to be powerful in everything he said and did. Our chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and he was crucified. And we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to set Israel free. Besides all that, this is now the third day since it happened. Some of the women of our group surprised us. They went at dawn to the tomb, but could not find his body. They came back saying they had seen a vision of angels who told them that he is alive. Some of our group went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, how slow you are to believe everything the prophets said. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther, but they held him back, saying, Stay with us, the day is almost over and it is getting dark. So he went in to stay with them. He sat down to eat with them, took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke the bread and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, wasn't it like a fire burning in us when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? They got up at once and went back to Jerusalem where they found the eleven disciples gathered together with the others and saying, the Lord is risen indeed, he has appeared to Simon. The two then explained to them what had happened on the road and how they had recognized the Lord when he broke the bread. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. The more obvious praises and phrases and phrases that come out from this, of course, are the well-known ones didn't our hearts burn within us? But there are others there, such as talked together. Isn't it a shame that we haven't really been able to talk to one another for a while? Jesus drew near is another lovely phrase. And then abide with us, stay with us. Then their eyes were opened. It's a wonderful story. And perhaps you choose to reflect a little bit more on that word or phrase that means something to you later in the day. This is a long and winding road. The mood of this couple, and some scholars think it was Cleopas and his wife, it may have been two male disciples, we don't know. But the mood of these two walkers is, of course, of disappointment, sadness, broken dreams. Hope seems to have gone. And so they went their way back from Jerusalem to Emmaus, about seven miles. And we're listening to the conversation between these two dejected disciples. We had hoped. He was the one to redeem Israel. But Messiah's dead, so it's the end of all our hopes of Israel becoming an independent nation again. As she was in the reign of King David, so now there's no hope for national freedom from Roman oppression and domination, and our friend has died as well. Or so they thought. So as they went their weary way home to their village of Emmaus, With a seemingly lost political cause, lost friend, grief, bereavement, all these very real emotions to all of us. We can identify, can't we, with their despair and their sadness in our recent dark days. The devastating results of the COVID-19 virus 
and of course the loss of a national significant member of the royal family. We can feel lost and disorientated. Maybe we feel like giving up. We don't know how we're going to carry on without a mother, a father, a best friend because the lights have gone out and we're in a temporary dark tunnel. The trek must have seemed endless because their dismay going over the sequence of events again and again and again, as you do when you've lost a loved one. You go back over the good times and the bad times. And into the midst of them comes a stranger whom they don't recognise. He doesn't seem to have a clue about the momentous news of a scourging, a mock trial, an execution of an innocent man, the death and the embalming of the body, the borrowed grave, and so on. We, the readers, know exactly what's gone on. But did you notice from the text as it was read that they were kept from recognizing him? I wonder why. Was it their grief? Was it something that God wanted to reveal to them slowly? We're not sure. But these two disciples were so lost in their own world, dazed by their tears, that at this point in the story, they were actually unable to recognize him. Such was their state of mind. They must have felt a bit like Peggy Lee singing that song. Is that all there is? Is that all there is, my friend? So let's keep dancing. Let's bring out the booze and have a ball. If that's all. The scriptures were revealed to them in Isaiah. The stranger speaks to them all the way through the important passages of the Torah, of the Old Testament, and telling them it's all part of God's plan. Was it not written that the Son of Man should suffer and die and be raised again on the third day, that death could not hold him? because he's God's son. Chuntering away goes those two brains of the disciples. I don't know about you, but I am thrilled whenever something new is revealed in the scriptures and I can relate it to Jesus and I think, yes, it was spoken about in Isaiah or it was spoken about in Micah. And the thing about the donkey in Palm Sunday, Zechariah prophesied that hundreds of years before. I wonder, friends, do we give enough uninterrupted time to searching the scriptures to find Jesus? Do we want Jesus to walk with us? Or have we become dull of hearing? Do we lack the motivation to want to know Jesus in all his fullness and the reality. We may not see him, but by his spirit, he is here this morning. He is walking up that aisle and he is listening to each one of you. Your heart's cries, just like he did with those disciples. And so, as is the Middle Eastern custom, these friends ask him, to stay the night. Oh, you can't be going away now. We've had a great conversation. Come, have a meal, stay the night, such is their custom. And then their guest becomes the host. As in Jewish tradition, he takes the top seat at the table and he is the one, not the homeowner, who breaks the bread and drinks the wine. And suddenly, as we do in communion, it clicks and we realize who is among us. He took the bread and broke it. 
And then there was full recognition. It is the Lord. Eyes full of surprise and joy. He isn't dead anymore. Just like he appeared to the others, he's appeared to little old us in our own little home. After all our unbelief and doubt and despair, hope against hope, he is here and they see his hands that still have the marks of the cross of the nails in them. And so these two disciples, all he spoke about, all he taught by the lake of Galilee and on that mountainside, come flooding back. I am the bread of life. Ah, I get it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Of course, Jesus would know all the scriptures. From knee high, he knew them. And of course, his heavenly father is God. My goodness, it is him. Take and eat my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus raised body held and still holds these marks of the nails because he, friends, is our great high priest always interceding or praying on our behalf. He understands weakness So he can say to us this morning, I understand how you feel because he's been through life, but he's raised again and conquered death so he can also be with us still in his risen form. What a hope. As we were saying last last week on Easter Sunday, it's a hope of eternal life that begins now when we believe in him. But are we like these disciples? I know I am. He said, how slow of heart to believe. How many times did Jesus say to the disciples, don't be afraid. Why are you slow of heart? Believe in me. Believe also in the things I teach. Jesus has been the one at the beginning of time who made this world. It's in him everything was made. And now it is being remade by the king of creation, by Jesus. Because he's raised to be this world's true Lord. So don't be fooled into thinking the politicians rule the roost. They don't. Jesus is Lord of creation. He is raised so we must be his witnesses. We must be his heralds and his messengers, announcing his lordship to the whole world, just as these early disciples did, building his kingdom here on on earth as it is in heaven. And so we can receive personal forgiveness, a rescue from sin and death and sorrow, and a rescue from the judgment of our willful God forgetfulness. We are renewed, we are restored. The whole of the fallen creative order has been restored and will be restored. We do not see it now, but one day we will. And so, Jesus chided these two for being slow of heart to believe. You see, our faith is not built on some kind of mental ascent. Oh, yes, I suppose Jesus lived. Yeah, he might have died, but no, I don't believe in this resurrection stuff. Or you might be lulled into the dwam and have lost sight of the power and veracity and hope that there is in the scriptures and in the power of God to raise from the dead. Let me read you a couple of very short passages from a lovely book that was put through my letterbox. It's a short piece from John Simpson's book, Not Quite World's End. John Simpson, of course, is a war correspondent who has done a lot of work for the BBC. He says this, sometimes it seems there are so many threats to our life and prosperity that it's hard to choose which of them to concentrate on. Human existence is becoming a little like 
One of those video games where you're a soldier dodging down endless corridors with some ludicrously large weapon in your hands, while enemies of every conceivable description jump out at you on all sides. That's maybe how those disciples felt. But now hear what C.S. Lewis has to say in his book, Miracles. Jesus has forced open a door that has been locked since the death of the first man, Adam. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he's done so. This is the beginning of the new creation. A new chapter in cosmic history has been opened by the resurrection. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we are so slow of heart to believe, so slow to share what we believe with others. Show us again your very self, that all our hope may be not in things that pass away, but in eternal things, in eternal life, in relationship with you. Amen. Before our closing hymn, we will, of course, be praying for others. Let us pray. Lord of hope, we give you thanks for a new start. We arise today turning our backs on the ways of judgment and criticism. We slough off our narrow-minded, earthbound assumptions. We reach out to you who has such a generous, compassionate heart. So for the promise of a new start, a new season, a new day, we thank you. We pray today, of course, for the royal family. We pray for the Queen. We pray for Charles, for Anne, for Andrew, Edward, and the wider family. Asking that on one level they are a family who has lost the patriarch, in some senses the head of their family, though not the head of state, the father, the grandfather, God, draw near to these people in their common humanity. Let them know that you've not left them. Let them know the hope that we've been talking about today. And let them know most of all that presence of Jesus walking with them through that dark tunnel back out to the light. We pray for the wider world today, Lord, for World Vision and other organizations and agencies like Water Aid that build wells and support children and young people in third world countries. God bless the management teams of all these organizations of Tear Fund Christian Aid. Lord, help us like these early disciples to have open hearts and open homes to strangers as well as loved ones when we're able to open up. And Lord, for those known to us where there's isolation, bring abundant life. Where there's abandonment and alienation, bring your resurrection life. And where there's longing and loneliness, fill their emptiness with life and love. All these prayers we pray in the name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. And now our closing hymn is 166, Lord of all hope. stand if you're able.
Lord, let us be like these Emmaus travelers. We need to know your peace and hope and joy so that we can share it where you are already at work in our community and in others that we love. And now the blessing of God our Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with each one of you, rest and abide with you today, this week and always. Amen. Please be seated and remember not to congregate outside but just keep to your little households, please.